Welcome to Dead Man Tolkien. Tonight's story is from the incredible mind of substantial bite 788 from over on Reddit, no sleep. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Cattle Killer. Let's get straight into that. After the first calf was killed, we walked the entire perimeter of the fence line, but there was no obvious signs of entry. Damn, did the son of a bitch jump over the top of the fence? My brother Davy inquired. Well, we better figure something out. I answered. Well, I'm trying, P. And that's what my family called me. My name is Peter, but when my younger sister was barely old enough to talk, she could only say P and nothing else. It stuck. I grew up on a cattle ranch. We raised beef cattle. It was once a good living, something worth the effort. But in time, corporate farming took over. The market pressure was immense. Cost skyrocketed, and soon we were in over our heads. It was my father's dream to live on a farm. He scraped and saved until finally he and mum had enough money to put down a down payment on a good plot of land far away from the city. My dad and my mum were city folk, but we grew up trying our best to be country folk. We were miserable at it. Twenty years in and two years ago, as I mentioned, everything went sour, dead in a red. Instead of sticking it out, my dad disappeared, headed off to who knows where. It left me, my mum, my brother and my sister to fend for ourselves. Luckily, Davy was knowledgeable, enough to know how to run the ranch in a fairly decent manner. He was the oldest and the smartest. In his late twenties, he held a deep grudge because of things he would never get to accomplish. He wanted to go to college, to go back to the city and claim the original family heritage. Good old-fashioned city hedonism. You see, Dad had a reputation, a bad one to say the least. He may have wanted to live in a country, but I often heard how much he enjoyed living in the city. My mum would say, he thought being in the country would make him pure. The city made him a scoundrel. My mum passed away not too long after Dad left, and now Davy would never get to be the fun-loving city scoundrel, acting like a God-fearing country Puritan like his dad. I was almost 18 when the cattle were slaughtered. I felt guilty, but in time, I had planned on leaving the ranch. I didn't want any damn part of it anymore. P, this thing is big. I don't see how it could go over the top. I just don't get it. We can't shore up the fence. Well, we got to figure something out. Ah, you already said that. And I could see Davy was a little irritated. And I found the first slaughtered cow. I was walking through the field to check on the feed. The calf was lying next to the hay feeder, and with her stomach ripped open and neck bent sideways. And it was a small kill, so we figured it was some coyotes. Another day, another calf. And that was the first time Davy and I inspected the fence. We strung some barbed wire across where we thought the predator was getting in. But that following Saturday, we found two more dead. But this time, it wasn't no calves. These were full-grown cows. They were a mangled mess, legs ripped apart from their bodies, insides all torn out and slung across the ground, and one of them had its head torn off. The last and final cow was an impossible scenario to explain. The cow was thrown up into a willow tree, hanging over a thick branch, headless and with its side torn away and missing. The ribs were visible, and I could smell the stench of blood, still dripping from the tree. Davy found it and got me out of bed. I need some help. You ain't gonna believe this shit. And when we got to the tree and I saw how the cow was positioned, horrible thoughts began to rush into my head. Oh, this ain't the work of a coyote, I said. Oh, you think this is someone trying to scare us? Maybe chase us from our land? Oh, I don't know, but suddenly I ain't worried so much about the cattle as I am for us. I hear it's an animal. A big, fucked-up animal, but it's an animal. 
Well, I think I know what we can do. I'm going to get some bear traps. Bear traps? I answered in disbelief. Where the hell are you going to get bear traps? Ain't they illegal? Ah, they are, but forever that old man that hangs out at the feedstock kept trying to sell me and dad some bear traps. He said we would need them one day. Well, maybe this is what he was talking about. I don't like it. What if Ali comes back here? Well, it's too dangerous, Davy. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on her. We just won't let her play back here. She have to stay in the front yard, close to the house. You or I will always be with her until we figure this out. Oh, yeah, but what if you catch a neighbor in that bear trap or an innocent kid just strolling around? P, what neighbors? We're miles away from the next nearest road and you're talking about neighbors. It's an animal. An animal? An animal that can throw a full-grown cow up in a tree? But Davy let out an angry sigh and stormed off towards the truck. That following day I watched as Ali played in the front yard. Every now and then, I would walk to the side of the house and see what Davy was doing. And I could see him bending down and setting the traps. He put one at every other post. He must have gotten more than a couple. Uh, P, why can't I go help Davy? Well, he's doing something important. It takes a lot of effort. Not something a little girl like you can manage. Well, I'm not a little girl. Without thinking, I answered. Uh, what he's doing is dangerous. Even for a grown man. Dangerous? She asked. I looked back at Ali, and I could see a little worry in her eyes. <sighs> I'm sorry. I just mean he's doing something important, and if we bother him, well, he could mess it all up. But David didn't get all the traps set until late afternoon. I could only make out his silhouette as he came scampering back towards the house. Man, what's wrong? He looked worried and confused. I heard something back in the woods. I felt like someone or something was watching me. What did you hear? I don't know. Heavy breathing or something. Let's get inside. His voice cracked with fear as he spoke. I followed him from behind and into the house. He was tapping his right hip with his hand. He always did that when he was nervous. Well, you're not telling me something. Just get in. He commanded as he held the door open. Where's Ali? She went upstairs to her room. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Calm down. And David turned and dashed upstairs, yelling for Ali. I had a guttural reaction before I began to realize that I didn't really remember seeing Ali go back into the house. She said she wanted to go to her room, but I didn't recall if she did or not. I just accepted that since she said it, she did it. And I was absolutely and horrifyingly wrong. Davy rushed back down the stairs. Where is she, P? Where's Ali? I can't believe you. I can't fucking believe you. She said she was going back into the house. I heard the door slam shut, I think. Well, I know she went back inside. And at that moment, we heard an animal howl in the distance. It was... It was fierce and yet full of pain. There was another howl and then a high-pitched screech. This kept up and increased in frequency and intensity. The howls began to sound like screams and the screams began to sound like howls. We finally realized that the screaming was coming from Ali, the howls from something else. Damn it, P. Ali's in the backyard. Now we ran around the house and down the side of the fence. I peered up towards the forest and the back of the fence line. Ali was only halfway up the left side of the fence, a little distance from the beast caught in a bear trap at the back. And she was firmly planted to the ground, her arms stiff by her side and her hands brought up into fists. And she was screaming so much that she would lose her breath, begin coughing, and then resume screaming. And when we reached her, Davy flung her up into his arms and held her tight to his chest. Don't look, Ali. And the sun was barely visible hidden behind the forest. And it was a scattering of sunlight cast through the leaves, illuminating the beast stuck up against the fence. It had to have been at least seven feet tall, a towering mound of fur, and with long arms and what I believed to be from that distance to be claws on its hands. Is that a werewolf? I asked. Shut up, P. 
It's just an animal. A werewolf? Ali asked. No, honey. Peace, silly. Well, the howling had never stopped. The beast was in obvious pain. Fear plus the irritation of that constant bellowing wore thin on my nerves. We need to get out of here. Davy, let's go. We need to get the police. Uh, we need to put it out of its misery. What? I said in disbelief as my eyes began to water. I could no longer contain my fear. Are you kidding? Uh, what are you, St. fucking Francis? That's a monster, Davy. A monster who ripped open cattle and threw one up in a tree like it was nothing. Uh, shut up. Just, just shut up. You're scaring Ali. He screamed. I'm scared, Davy. I'm scared too. You're talking stupid. Let's just get out of here. Here. Davy set Ali down and fumbled into his pockets. He pulled out the truck keys and handed them to me. Take Ali and get out of here. I'll call you when I'm done. What? Oh, come on, leave it. It'll either escape or die. We just have to leave and wait it out. Oh, I can't do that. First of all, I need to kill it to make sure it's never a danger to us or the cattle anymore. Second, it's just an animal. It doesn't know what it's doing. Well, it's not evil. It's suffering. It needs to be put down. We're losing a ranch anyway. Why are you fooling yourself? Let it go. Let all of it go. You don't give a shit about this ranch anyway. Go. Get out of here. David went back towards the house. I knew he was going for the rifle. Oh, he was a stubborn, to see the end kind of guy. I took Ali by the hand and walked back towards the truck. She fought me and tried to run back to Davy. Come with us, Davy. Come with us, she yelled as I dragged her along. Davy stormed out the door, rifle in hand, and with a stern, determined look on his face. His mission was one of mercy and defense, and he was damned willing to die for it. I finally got Ali in the truck. I had to hold her tight to me as I tried to start the truck. Every time I tried to turn the ignition, she would reach for the door. Stop, damn it. Just fucking stop. Oh, stupid ass Davy. I banged my fists against the steering wheel. We heard a gunshot and Ali stopped squirming and sat still. Was it over? I had to see for myself. I turned the engine over and backed out of the driveway. I drove the truck slowly down the street until I could see the backyard. The beast had broken loose from the bear trap, limping slowly along to our barn and dragging Davy behind him. Davy, who wasn't moving or attempted to get away. Is Davy all right? I don't see him. And I couldn't answer. I saw him and I didn't like what I saw. And I sat there in silence. I was drawing up in my mind the different scenarios, the different ethical outcomes of my uncommitted decisions. Should I try and save Davy and leave Ali in the house, or should I drive away with Ali and assume Davy already dead? And I began to weep. The weight of my choice was too much of a burden for me to handle. And Ali saw me crying and began to cry too. She was smart enough to know something difficult lie ahead. I pulled the truck back into the driveway and turned the engine off. I took Ali back into the house, and she was submissive, even quiet, strangely quiet, as if the good brother was already dead. Why worry about the less significant brother? And I took her into the house. All right, well, when I leave, go lock every door in the house, front and back door. Go up to your room and lock that door as well. I reached into my pocket and had it her my phone. Call the police and tell them you need help immediately. Don't tell them there's a monster. Say there's a bad man on our land. Do you understand? And she nodded her head, yes, as she closed her eyes. Be careful, P. Please, save Davy. I went outside. I heard the deadbolt lock from the other side. And I gathered myself, took a deep breath, and walked around the side of the house. I didn't see any sign of Davy or the beast, but I could see the barn door swung wide open. I made my way up to the back of the fence line. The rifle was on the ground near the fence post, and with blood smeared across the stock. 
I picked up the rifle. I knew it probably had at least two shots left. When I stumbled a bit, I put my hand out to catch myself. My hand landed against the post. As I was looking down, I noticed that the beast's foot and ankle were lying in a bear trap. Its mechanical jaws clamped tight. The flesh well, it was gnawed and torn. It was apparent the beast had chewed through its ankle to escape the trap and Davy. There was also a brownish-grey tuft of fur snagged on the barbed wire. And when I got to the barn, huh, I hesitated. I pondered what I should do. What was my plan? My mind was too scrambled to come up with something rational, and so I decided to move forward and accept my fate. I stepped lightly through the interior, looking side to side in each stable, gone at the ready and heart beating angrily at my chest. There was a trail of blood contrasting sharply against the hay on the ground leading to the last stall on the right. Now the barn was darker than I had anticipated before going in. I now longed for a flashlight or a lantern. The further I stalked into the barn, the darker it got. Now the darkness was not overbearing, but it did hinder my ability to see the finer details. And I finally got to the last stall and quickly pointed a rifle inside. Two men were lying in the stool. Davy flat on the ground and a stranger leaned up against the back wall. His chest was heaving up and down, the air wheezing as it had escaped his weakening body. I saw his right leg bleeding profusely, a fleshy, gnarly stump with no foot or ankle. I saw that Davy had claw marks slashed across his face and his neck had a gaping wound. Unlike the stranger, Davy's chest was not moving. I pulled the butt of the rifle up to my shoulder, ready to shoot at the darkened mass at the back of the stool, when I heard it speak. Son, it spoke weakly. The stranger leaned forward, and in the glare of the strip of light shining through the tied wooden barn slats, I saw my father's face. And after a momentary flash of nostalgia, I pulled the trigger and shot. Wow, 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 wow. Short but absolutely awesome story there. From the incredible mind of Substantial Bite 788 from over on Reddit, No Sleep. Big thank you, Substantial, for allowing me to narrate your story on the channel. Absolutely awesome writing. And I can't wait to see what else you produce in the future. Well, guys and girls, as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now if you have a story to share with us here on the show, then please do get in touch with me with the contact email. Contact the dead one at gmail.com I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you're all well and happy guys and girls fighting fit and are starting to enjoy the now warmer weather as summer starts to dawn upon us. Whatever it is that you do, I hope you're enjoying it and are giving it your all. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>